Hey everyone, today I'd like to talk about Paradox Interactive's Victoria 3 and what we'd like to see in it. Now before we get too far, I should probably describe what we're talking about. There exists a company called Paradox Interactive. Paradox Interactive makes, in my opinion, the best grand strategy games in existence. And what do I mean by grand strategy? I mean, you don't just, it's not just a strategy game where you control armies and attack each other. You also have to manage the economy, the politics, the population, and the trade of the country that you're in charge of as well. In this company's lineup, Paradox Interactive, they have a game for just about each time period. They have Imperator Rome, which it takes place during the Roman time period, Crusader Kings, which takes place during the medieval time period, Europa Universalis, which takes place during the colonial time period, and then there's Victoria II, which takes place between 1836 and 1936, which is presumably the same date and time that Victoria III would take place in. Really quick, if you enjoyed the video, or at least you didn't think it was a waste of time, I'd really appreciate it if you took the time to like, comment, and subscribe. It's really good for the YouTube algorithm. And subscribe and hit that alert bell so that you know when I can upload again. I'm excited to hear more about Victoria 3. I've been hearing a bit about its upcoming release date as well, so I'm sure that there's going to be a few more videos about that coming out. So make sure that you guys do subscribe so you get all the information, okay? All important other links are in the description down below, but let's continue with the video. Paradox's own description of Victoria 2 goes like this. Carefully guide your nation from the era of absolute monarchies in the early 19th century through expansion and colonization to finally become a truly great power by the dawn of the 20th century. Victoria 2 is a grand strategy game played during the colonial era of the 19th century where the player takes control of a country, guiding it through industrialization, political reforms, military conquest, and colonization. Experience an in-depth political simulation where every action you take will have various consequences all over the world. The population will react to your decisions based on their, their political awareness, social class, as well as their willingness to accept or revolt against their government. Personally, I think that description's fairly accurate. You take control of any country that exists on January 1st, 1836, and then the game goes by day by day until the end of 1935, so January 1st, 1936. So for 100 years, you control the entirety of a country, and as an example, you can take control of the United States in 1836. You get to decide how you want to deal with the American Civil War, or the Mexican-American War, whether you want these things to happen, whether you want to go even farther than America did, when America went historically, or whether you want to do less than what America did historically. It's really a fascinating time period as well. Some people would describe it as a very boring time in history. It's the concert of Europe is what many people would call it. It's really a very focused type of gameplay though that I think they're going for. And I think that the people who say that miss the point of what these games try to capture. And that's what I want to talk about with what we want, what we expect in Victoria 3. Couple of quick little side notes though that I should uh, make to you guys. One, these are my personal opinions, and I also think that um, in my in my dream game it would be a very complex political simulation of the time period. But I think that we have to be willing to compromise with some of the more casual players and the newer game styles that Paradox Interactive has put into their games. So some of these thoughts, even though they are going to be my own opinion, are going to be watered down a little bit from my actual dream game so that we can really just get the best game in front of us. If you like what I'm saying, please be sure to hit that like button down below to show me that you agree with what I'm saying and also to help out with that YouTube algorithm. And if you don't like what I'm saying, please leave a comment down below telling me what you disagree with and what you think would be great in this new game, if we even get Victoria 3. Fingers crossed, man. Just so you guys know my bias, I really want this game to exist. First, I think we should take a brief little look at how Victoria 2 works, or how Victoria 2 organizes the gameplay elements of its game, so that we can see how they could jump into Victoria 3. Now, Victoria 2 organizes its gameplay into tabs, and those tabs are production, where you manage the production of your country, what your country makes, industrially or from raw resources. Uh, budget, where you manage the tax rates of your uh, economy and your, your population, as well as the spending on your military and things like that. Technology, where you of course determine how your country advances through time, whether you can get to breech-loaded rifles versus muzzle-loaded rifles, because this was a time where Warfare was entirely changed. In 1836, they fought different than they fought in 1936. It's night and day. We're talking about before the Civil War, to Civil War, to World War I. So there's quite a bit of time there where technology was rapidly changing and wars were just different. 
Then there's politics, um, is another tab that they organize the game into, and that's where you manage your political parties and how the game operates. Then population, where you can see uh, the jobs that your population has and how they feel about you and what their demographics are, both religion-wise and culturally. And then there is trade, where you determine what the imports and exports of your country are, which ties in with production pretty well. Diplomacy, where you of course set up alliances and uh, different wars and things like that with other countries. And finally, the military tab is the other tab that they organize the game into, where it allows you to manage your military. I've organized these into three different categories. So category one is going to be like the production trade category. Category two will be politics and diplomacy, budget and population, sort of like the domestic things that handle your, that you do in your country. And then the third category I have are military and technology, which I think go pretty hand in hand. Now even though I've separated these into those three categories, there's definitely going to be some overlap, so just bear with me here while I go over what each of these categories does, and then what, what I would want them to do in Victoria 3. I think that's going to be the best way in order to determine what we'd like to see in this next game. Now, category number one was production and trade. The way that works in Victoria 2 is there are a bunch of raw resources that are across the map, and these raw resources might be things like cotton, spices, grain, fruit, metal, timber, you name it. If a raw resource is there, it exists pretty much in the game. And then you can build factories in your country that turn those raw resources into industrial goods or into more advanced products. So for example, if you want to start a clothing factory, maybe it would take cotton and wool and turn that into regular clothing for people. Or maybe you would take timber and metal and that would make a gun factory. So there's a kind of like a tree that forms how production works in that game. And generally, I think most of this can be left alone when going into Victoria 3. Now, I think though, what could be done to simplify it a little bit is it could be based a bit more off of the Stellaris model. In Stellaris, it's basically the same thing, just way more watered down. Now, I don't want it as watered down as Stellaris. In Stellaris, I believe it's just minerals, food, and credits. And those three things can be turned into basically a, two other resources, which are consumer goods and military goods. So really, there's only five types of resources there. I say keep a lot of the same old resources that are in Victoria 2, and but simplify how they go into factories together and make it really obvious to us how all of this works. Victoria 2 was a great game, but it was a very complex game that was very hard to understand how all of the production was all tied in together and how it all worked. And I think that they could basically keep the production system very similar to how it was, just update it with showing us a little bit more on what's going on, make the numbers simpler. Maybe you could even limit some of the categories down a bit, maybe instead of making guns and artillery and airplanes and tanks as four different things. Maybe those four things could be simplified into military goods. Maybe wine and liquor could be mixed down in together into luxury goods. Maybe clothing and luxury clothing, which are two different categories as well in Victoria 2, could just be put into a category of clothing. So basically keep it the same, just simplify it a little bit so we have a little bit more, it's not just overwhelming when we take a look at how all of this operates. And then it will lead us a bit into trade. Now trade, there isn't a ton we can really talk about there. Allow countries to trade with each other, that's going to be important, and they need to make sure that there's some sort of relationship with production and trade. And what I mean by that is, there has to be a set amount of resources that are being pulled off of each tile in the game, and then that has to be consistent throughout the world. So what I mean is, all of these things can't be abstract to their own country, which I believe is a little bit more of how the trade system works in Europa Universalis, where trade val goods just have a certain value associated with them, but you're not really producing a set number of goods. In Victoria 3, I would like to see a certain number of goods being produced, and then, so make it finite, I guess is what I'm saying, as opposed to abstract, and then have the ability to allow trade to flow through countries. What I'd really like to see with trade though, and this is going to kind of cross over to our second category, which is diplomacy and politics, trade needs to be tied to diplomacy and 
politics. This era is the Victorian era, the era where major empires in Europe were not really overtly controlling other countries in the world, they were more dominating them through trade. So I would like to see a situation or a, a relationship mechanic in the game that allows you to force other countries to not tax your goods if you're trading between them, or force other countries to have open trade agreements. I would love to see the expansion of the diplomatic and political system in these games to allow for countries to set up free trade zones, something like NAFTA in the modern world, or even to make their puppets cut off enemies there. Give us a reason in the game to monopolize certain things. As Britain, I want to know that if I go and take over all of the coal complete pieces of the entire map, I can block off coal from my enemies. Give us real organic ways to inspire wars and to inspire conflict. Nothing really inspires conflict like blocking off key resources to another country. Let us believe that the world is alive. And that's gonna be a major theme of what I talk about here because more than anything, I think we just want to, the world to feel like it's alive. Now, along with that, that was kind of diplomacy, is politics. Politics, I want to tie in with trade and production as well. What political party you have and what type of government you have should affect your ability to control your economy. I would love to see a return of the laissez-faire and the state capitalist models from Victoria 2. So what I mean is, in Victoria 2, let's say that you are America and you're a democracy. Being a democracy, you can't control what political party is in charge. A political party can win based on its popularity and then will take over the government, and you have to follow the rules of that political party. So for example, if the laissez-faire party takes over, you can't physically build factories in your country, you have to rely on your citizens to build your factories. But if, let's say, the nationalist party takes over or the socialist party takes over, they can use government funds to just ma mass produce factories. We need to see a return of that system and the return of feeling like our country is alive. Now, along with that as well, if you're an absolute monarchy, you can pick and choose which political parties are involved in there. Now, I'd love to see a lot more interactivity when it comes to the government and when it comes to politics that happens in your country. I want to feel like I'm creating a dream country, a country that I have a vision for, and I want the tools to be able to do that. If I want to create a monarchy that has a very free market economy and open borders, but it's extremely militaristic, I want to be able to create that. If I want to create a democracy that's really militant to outsiders and also closes its borders to everybody who wants to trade with me, but is also anti-war, just an isolationist power, I also want to be able to do that. Give us the tools to make the country that we want want to play as. And also with these things is going to be population, and population should be tied in with politics, have the different policies that you have affect how the population, you know, feels about your country, and all of that good stuff. Anyways, I think what I'm kind of getting at there though is they can basically keep a lot of those systems the same in Victoria, just revamp them. One thing, one system I will say, and this is going to be one of those compromise situations where Victoria could work out in a newer world, is they need to do something different with the pop system. It seems like it breaks a lot in Victoria too. Maybe they could rework it and keep things the way that they are, and you could have actually like down to the specific number, how many people are in your country, but I don't know if they need to do that. One thing that I think that they could do that would be a totally fine compromise from, on my, in my opinion, let me know if you guys disagree with this, is they could take the population system from Imperator Rome. Now, not original Imperator, but the way that it works now. Take the exact same pop system in Imperator, move it into Victoria 3, and I think that you'd actually be basically fine there. I don't know if I need to know that Russia has, let's say, 60 million men in it. You can just say that it has... 6,000 pops, and I can do the math in my head to abstractly guess as to how many people that is. It'll keep the game a lot simpler, it'll allow for better multiplayer with less out of syncs, and I just think that it would be an easier compromise with that. But different pops also need to have different jobs assigned to them, which is also something that is done fairly well in Imperator. I would, I would judge. It just needs to be a little bit more complex to match the production and the trade systems that would be in these games. The economy and budget part of the game should affect how your country operates. If you raise taxes on the wealthy people, there should be a direct direct correlation with wealthy people leaving your country or being demoted to lower citizens. The beautiful thing in Victoria 2 and what should exist in Victoria 3 is that each of these systems isn't independent. They interweave with each other and I get that that makes it a way more complicated game and probably a much harder game to develop, but if you want people to love this game and appreciate it and really feel like the world's alive, these things have to fully 
weave into each other. So for example, make the number of soldiers that you have in the game, which is like your military tab, be a direct number from your population. And then if you get into a major war and you lose all your soldiers, that should be a direct hit. Those people should be your farmers that don't exist anymore in your own country. Make consequences matter. It's a hundred years. You have to pack in all the consequences you can. Make it organic, make it believable, make the world alive. In the military tab, when it comes to controlling militaries, the tricky thing is that because war has shifted as well so much throughout this time, is war tactics have changed a lot as well. But it's it's even from a game level, it's simpler than that. Even in Victor or Europa Universalis 4, if you've played that game, in the beginning of the game, let's say you start as France, you might have an army of about 30,000 guys that you organize into two armies of 15,000 each. Well, halfway through the game, you've got six armies of 30,000 guys each. The number of guys you have in your military grows exponentially, and this is the same in Victoria 2 as well. In the beginning of the game, you have a pretty manageable army usually, unless you're a country like Russia or Austria or something, but you know the biggest turnoff in that game is that whenever I get into a war, I just want to turn the game off, not because I think I'm going to lose the war, but because, come on, I don't want to play as Russia invading Poland and pausing every two seconds to move a couple of units here and there. For what? Usually not really that much of a benefit or a loss from the war. I'll just take the, I'll just take the loss. Or I'll use a cheat code or something like that instead to get around it. It's really frustrating. So what I'd like to see, some people say it should have the Hearts of Iron system. I completely disagree with that. I don't want simple waves of guys moving across. I actually would be a lot more happy with something like the Imperator system as well for the military, which is it basically works the same way, but you, you could, should be able to assign an AI commander to your own armies. You should be able to uh, give off control of your AI to your or give off the control of your own armies to your AI and then assign them some goals that they should do. So for example, you should be able to assign like four guys, uh, four armies of 40,000 guys with the goal of being offensive in a specific region. That is something that I would be much more enthusiastic to see. It could easily be done. It's the same system that works in Imperator. You could assign them to guard certain important locations. You could just give them some really easy commands. Just make it easier for us to macro manage our armies. I don't want to be micromanaging the Russian army in World War I. It's just too much. It's not sexy. It's not fun. And it just gets old. I don't know. It kind of sucks. Then finally, there's technology. I actually don't really have too many gripes with this. I don't think that technology is that big of a deal. Sure, there has to be some sort of technological advancement, but I don't know. There's some things that I'd like to see personally, like uh, some sort of technology web where you could really try to make the country the way that you want to make it, but I'm not too worried about it. And I don't know. I, I think that they could basically keep the technology the same or just slightly tweak it or just rob it from a different game. Uh, it's fine. A couple of additional features I'd really like to see is when declaring a war, I would love to have a lot of control as to how you can uh, interact with other countries. So what that would mean is I want to be able to puppet other countries and determine what their type of government is as well. I want to be able to form trade blocks. I want to be able to form huge alliances, just like in World War One, how those kind of shook out. I would really like some organic ways that you could, I don't know, run your country in order to manage things. I'm okay with there being some national focus trees, but I really don't think the game should be railroaded. For the most part, I would really like to see a freeform game that's open to interpretation, where you can do whatever you want, a real sandbox, not like Hearts of Iron, more like Europa in that way. One thing that I would really love to see, and this needs to show up as some in some sort of category, is a return of something like the Great Power System and the sphere of influence system where you can create your pull other countries into your sphere of influence and then that could, allows you to open up the trading with those countries. I want to see a bit more control as to how the trade is dealt with in that way, but generally I'd like to see a return of countries managing their spheres of influences. It shouldn't be a game about outright just conquering countries, it shouldn't be a map painter, it should be a game about pulling countries into your sphere of influence so that you can maximize your return on them. It should almost be like an economic simulation first and then a political simulation as opposed to a political simulation then an economic simulation. Just my thoughts. Anyway, no matter what, when the game comes out, I'm going to get it, I'm going to play it, I'm sure I'll have a great time with it. These are just the things that I would like to see from it. Let me know if there's anything that I missed that you guys think would also be very cool. Let me know if you disagreed with anything down in the comments down below. And of course, if you like the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. I always appreciate when the channel grows, and it's not a very huge channel, so I'd really, I don't know, throw your favorite creators a bone. Which are 
Can't wait to see all you other Von Bismarcks and Von Clauswitz out there, you Victorias. Can't wait to see you guys out there trying to conquer the world through what? Iron and blood or whatever the saying is. Until next time though, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.